All right, great. Let me go ahead and actually get going uh, as people join the line, just to welcome everyone to, again, our first Friday webinar series. And uh, we are really excited today. As always, we try to bring you some really good content in terms of information and insights that will help you uh, as aquarium and zoo partners of the Ocean Project engage, and museums too, I should say, engage your visitors and inform policymakers uh, to advance ocean conservation. So uh, today we've got a very special guest in Sophie Hume of Communications Inc. who will talk to us about the One Ocean Flotilla effort, a really innovative uh, communications messaging effort uh, that is really uh, taking off. So uh, with that, uh, let me though just quickly go through um, a bit of what we're gonna cover today. Uh, and as you'll see, we do have our special guest coming up here, Sophie. Uh, who will talk about the One Ocean Flotilla. Please, during her talk and as we go along here, put some questions for her in the chat as you think of them. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end. And as always, really want to hear um, and the opportunity for you to ask about how all of this good work that's being done uh, by Sophie and her team applies to you in your context as zoos, aquariums, and museums. Uh, the last thing is, as always, we need to thank uh, that this webinar series is made possible uh, through the generous support of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. So uh, uh, thank you uh, to them as always for that. Uh, the quick little housekeeping things I wanted to run through are actually some uh, little updates. And just to thank everyone, we did have some, a good response to the survey we put up about your interest in uh, specifically our efforts to advance ocean conservation in keeping with the 30 by 30 campaign. Uh, we now have uh, 70 some individuals from 40 plus uh, zoos, aquariums and museums who've signed on. If you've yet to sign on or are interested in that, you know, I'll remind you of this at the end, please email me and my email address will go up in the chat here during the webinar. Um, the next thing to note is that with the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, uh, we do have from them, from that incoming administration, a day one commitment. I always like to take day one commitments as soon after they're inaugurated uh, to set a national goal of achieving 30 by 30. By no means does this mean the work is done. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do around ensuring that it's actually implemented. It's not just a goal, but it's, actual, uh, it's put into action. And, uh, but there is some good news there and likely a good opportunity uh, for all of us to, we know it works well to thank people for doing the right thing as a way to both show our support and inform our audiences. So stay tuned on that. Uh, last but not least, uh, 14 uh, other national leaders recently put up a report uh, on ocean solutions, as you can see here from the title that benefit people, nature and the economy, always what we like to see. And uh, those 14, um, you know, I, what I'm hearing is that that document's gonna really help set the agenda on the international stage uh, for what we are doing, uh, will be doing and where the ocean community will be headed. And, and with that, I do wanna introduce our, uh, our, guest, our guest here, uh, Sophie Hume from uh, Communications Inc. I'll let her tell you a little bit more about the good work that they're doing. And they have actually uh, the, what should have been the fourth report on that last slide uh, that I didn't add there is the great one that's come out from them with some really solid uh, communications advice. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Sophie, let me pass it over to you. And uh, so you can run through your good work uh, with the folks on the line here. Great. Hi all, thank you very much for the introduction and um, should I turn my video on? No. Um, thanks for the introduction, thanks for the opportunity. Um, it's really great to be able to talk to you all. Um, my name is Sophie Hume. I'm one of the directors at Communications Inc. So Communications Inc is a campaign and communications agency which we've been around for about 15 years. Um, it's the go-to agency um, in the international ocean space. We're both suppliers and drivers within the field, and we've kick-started many ocean initiatives to address um, significant campaign gaps. 
Um, so, for example, we're very involved in um, the High Seas Alliance, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, and engaged um, on a number of 30 by 30 projects. Uh, we work very closely with, lucky enough to work very closely with Jane Lubchenco um, on her MPA guide work. Um, so, we have seen a lot of changes in the ocean space in the last few years. 2020, as you may have known, was due to be the super year for the ocean. So it was called the super year because there were a number of key political decisions that were due to be made. So that included um, a high seas treaty, uh, 30 by 30 was due to be negotiated at the um, CBD meeting. Um, and we were all set to have better integration of the ocean into the UNFCCC climate process. But unfortunately, like with so many things, COVID meant that many of these meetings were canceled. So the projects um, that I am going to introduce to you on this presentation are all initiatives that um, have aimed to basically ensure in this post-COVID world that the ocean stays on the political agenda, that audiences and stakeholders understand the role of the ocean um, at an earth system level, and that we communicate that protecting nature and investing in it is key to our recovery from this pandemic. Next slide, please. So the first project I want to tell you about is the One Ocean Flotilla. Um, we're very lucky that we have the Ocean Project who are a member of that flotilla. The flotilla is funded by the Packard Foundation um, and it is an unbranded collective drive to achieve maximum impact for the ocean. So flotilla organize, oh, could I ask you to go? Nope, sorry. Um, the Fertilla organisations are all invested in the health of the whole ocean and they support the core goals for ocean protection. So it supports groups to align around a set of key principles, which I will talk you through shortly. Um, it's developed in collaboration with and is guided by ocean organisations. It's informed by the work of scientists and other experts, and it's open globally to all non-governmental organisations sharing its principles and values. Next slide, please. So you can see here, we have our, our picture of the flotilla and here. This indicates that all the flotilla's sails are up. So the coalition is focused on how best to put communications in the driving seat across the ocean community and deploy it at strategic interventions and moments. So a strategic moment, such as a negotiation, we mobilize the flotilla network and members. Uh, we provide them and support them with assets. Um, and we ask groups to raise their sail around a common set of messages, narratives, and asks. Um, I think there are around 80 plus groups now in the flotilla um, and they have a reach between them of several million through their various different platforms and memberships so you know being able to collate all of those groups around a key set of asks is is a real opportunity next slide please so the principles that we are focused on there are five key principles so the first is around climate and ocean breakdown so that is tackling climate breakdown and holding warming to as close at 1.5 degrees. We want all states within the UNFCCC process to um, commit to new and more ambitious um, NDCs in 2021 to reduce emissions. So NDCs are nationally determined commitments. So it's basically, oh, sorry. It's basically what countries um, can do. Um, the high seas, so the high sea makes up nearly half the planet and two thirds of the whole ocean. A new international treaty is being negotiated at the UN and we need this to be robust and completed as soon as possible. Um, 30 by 30, which I know a lot of you guys are very familiar with, um, that is state parties to convention um, of CBD, which is referred to as CBD, sorry, the Convention on Biodiversity. They will be negotiating new targets to protect um, biodiversity. The targets um, are to protect at least 30% of the ocean through implemented highly and fully marine protected areas, and that for the remaining 70% of the ocean to be sustainably managed through equitable decision making. The, that meeting is we supposed to happen in May next year, but I think it's likely it will be postponed to autumn. 
Um, the report that was mentioned in the introduction, so 14 heads of state, the report that came out yesterday, they all supported 30%, uh, 30 by 30, um, and also 100% sustainable management of the ocean. So that's like been a real, a real key moment um, for this campaign. Um, we are also looking at ocean resilience. So as we know, the ocean absorbs around 90% of excess heat in the atmosphere and around 30% of carbon dioxide, providing climate change mitigation. But the climate um, crisis is meaning that the ocean is being profoundly damaged. We can't currently protect um, ocean impacts caused by climate breakdown, but we can remove the other stresses. So this is meaning that we are focused on um, campaigns looking at illegal and destructive overfishing to extraction and mining and harmful aquaculture, noise and plastic pollution. And lastly, the final principle that we brought in during COVID was around what we're calling blue nature. So the ocean had done quite well in terms of moving up the political agenda in the run up to 2020. As COVID came along, um, it dropped right back down again. So we need to maintain, maintain momentum for ocean protection during this pandemic and build on opportunities presented within the discourse around a better for nature post COVID world. So we need to ensure that the recognition of the importance of nature and human well-being, and that the ocean is automatically recognized as part of nature and therefore included in dialogue and ultimately any decision making that's made. So that's quite detailed, but I just think it's worth sort of bearing in mind that within the ocean community, there are you know, some fundamental things that we ask everybody to get behind um, and these are them. So next slide, please. I'm just gonna cancel my Skype. Great, so I wanted to talk to you all a little bit and introduce what we call the response room briefing. So the response room briefing goes out um, every two to three weeks. Um, its objective is to inform communications work of the flotilla. Um, and what it does is it analyzes conversations, narrative themes and trends around keywords, climate and ocean across legacy and social media. So it's currently actually only looking at English speaking, but international um, legacy and social media. And by legacy media, we mean sort of, you know, newspapers um, and broadcast media. So earlier in the year, the One Ocean Response briefing looked at the intersections between COVID-19, the environment and the ocean. Uh, because it, during this period, it was really important to understand the kind of conversations that were going on in this place, in this space sorry what was resonating with people and why and to ensure that any communication input inputs that were um put out were kind of relevant reading what was going on you know in terms of how people were feeling um and to ensure that they were impactful as possible um, and at the very least actually didn't do harm in what was a very sensitive time um, next slide please as we are slowly coming out, well, we are still very much actually in a pandemic, um, but we have now changed our focus to look at the intersection of ocean and climate. And this is really to support and set groups up for the opportunities next year. Next year, 2021, you know, people will be very much focusing on biodiversity and the opportunities around 30 by 30. So through the analysis, um, we wanted to better understand the way that climate and the ocean are covered in legacy and social media. And what we found is that coverage is very low in volume and it's very fragmented in topic and mostly covering various threats to ocean health. The objectives of these briefings is that we inform and enable the ocean community to better understand how audiences interact with climate and ocean issues um, identify communication gaps um, and to close, to, sorry, communication gaps to close and areas to overlap. Um, we'll continue to monitor this over 2021. Um, this is really, really important in terms of informing the 30 by 30 discussions next year, because establishing marine protected area networks is critical to maintaining climate change resilience and rebuilding um, 
uh, and ecological and social resilience. So for examples, MPAs that protect coastal habitats, such as barrier islands and coral reefs and mangroves and wetlands, reduce human vulnerability in the face of climate change and provide a natural infrastructure um, on what um, that we as people rely on. So in zoos and aquariums are key players in disseminating these messages. What we really need is we need these messages around the role of the ocean and what needs to be done to reach large members of the public. And zoos and aquariums and museums are one of the most effective and far reaching ways to do this. So via the Ocean Project, we really look forward to seeing how we can engage with you guys. Um, the next project that I'm going to talk to you about um, is a literacy project and we will be working in partnership actually with the Ocean Project in 2021. So this campaign is called Drop the S. Um, so words are very important and the way that we communicate and influence the way that people think, feel and act. The first ocean principle is that the earth has one big ocean with many features. The different parts of the ocean are all part of one interconnected circulation system and all the, although the ocean is large, it is for in, it's finite and its resources are limited. So in summary, there's only one ocean and although we do give it those different names, there is only one ocean and it works as a whole and it helps make life on earth possible. So that's why we are asking everybody quite simply that you drop the S from the end of the word ocean. So on the next slide, um, we're just going to play a very short animation that tells you a little bit about dropping the S. So next slide, please. So thanks. So I don't, I, uh, there wasn't any sound on there, but I think that was okay. There were actually two animations that we made. Um, this one, there was one that we made, um, which was unfortunately the one I thought I had on here, but I'd obviously uploaded the wrong one, which uh, was a sort of play on dropping the S. What this animation aimed to do was to show that we are all connected. So it shows, you know, that we are one that we all connected by one ocean and all the different activities and things that we do within there. So anyway, I will make sure that I send a link through on this chat to the other one. Um, I am um, the, the slide that follows, um, it's actually been run by my colleague, Natalie Hart, and she has just made a very short um, two minute video to tell you a little bit more about it. Um, when you go to the next slide, I think, can you make sure that there's sound on this one? So it would actually not be, yeah. yeah. It, can we get- And started? apologies for that. I'm not sure what's happening with the lack of sound. I'm gonna try again here. And if it doesn't work, we'll just, uh, unfortunately just it's go ahead and we can, to the next yeah. slide if that's okay. So Hi, my name is Natalie Hart and I work with the One Ocean Flotilla. I'm here to talk about the Drop the S campaign, an initiative funded by the UK branch of the Kaluska Blenkin Foundation. The Drop the S campaign encourages people to talk about the ocean in singular, not plural. 
because there is only one interconnected global ocean. The challenge that our project seeks to address is a lack of consistency and alignment in global ocean communications. While ocean literacy is widely considered to be vital as a step in encouraging people to live and act more sustainably, as an ocean community, we sometimes overlook the basic ocean literacy principles ourselves. So why do we say drop the earth? Principle one of ocean literacy is that the earth has one big ocean with many features. Words are important and the way that we communicate influences the way that people think, feel and act. Talking about the ocean reinforces the notion of connectedness. It solidifies people's understanding that what happens in one part of the ocean will affect other parts too. And it reminds people that the ocean is part of one global system. What goes on in the ocean affects all of us and our language needs to reflect this. The Drop the S campaign started in 2019. It's a straightforward campaign launched with an animation and a Drop the S hashtag. The animation is lighthearted and fun to encourage engagement and bonding with target audiences. In 2020, we released a second version of the animation to reflect life in the pandemic and the new way that we were all connected through Zoom. In the two week period around World Ocean Day, when the second animation was launched, the Drop the S hashtag was used around 800 times and gained a considerable 6 million impressions. In the press, Forbes wrote an article on our campaign asking, is it ocean or oceans? At the virtual ocean dialogues hosted by the World Economic Forum and Friends of Ocean Action, dropping the S was referenced in the opening speech. And IOC UNESCO had a social media day dedicated to dropping the S. What is even more encouraging for us is to see the phrase snowball and be used beyond our immediate network. People have adopted dropping the S into their own campaigns and content, and we're seeing increased use of the One Ocean Global map popping up all over the ocean world. Of course, Global Ocean Envoy Peter Thompson also continues to champion the use of the word ocean in singular in many of his engagements. It's a simple ask and a straightforward campaign, but it is a gateway to much wider and deeper ocean-friendly behaviour. Please do drop the S because accuracy is an act of ocean protection, and by protecting the ocean, we protect ourselves. Thanks. Thanks very much. So yeah, um, wherever you can, drop the S and let people know that you are doing so. Uh, the final project I wanted to talk to you about was a new report that was launched um, uh, last Tuesday. So it is called Evolving the Narrative for Protecting a Rapidly Changing Ocean Post-COVID-19. So this year a group of international marine scientists came together to develop and evolve the narrative to protect a rapidly changing ocean. The resulting report was published in Journal Aquatic Conservation and it sets out six key themes for an ocean narrative and includes um, an appendix on the agreed fundamentals of what the ocean does for mankind. Next slide, please. So why do we need a narrative? Well, the report authors detail that most people don't understand how deeply embedded we all are in the systems that sustain life on Earth, how those systems exert a huge influence on human well-being, and how humans in turn exert a huge impact on functioning um, and the vi viability of this Earth system. So the reality is that the ocean is still largely ignored part of the Earth system with insufficient protection and management. So we must acknowledge the importance of the ocean and reset and reframe the discussion in the face of these direct human impacts. This includes overfishing, habitat destruction, as well as climate um, disruption. So there were six narrative themes, all driven by science. Um, the next slide actually was a, a very short video, but I don't think we should play that because of time. Um, but I will share the link and it is looking at why is communication important for ocean science. So there we got the report authors um, who all just did a short piece, piece to camera about why communications need to be central. If you go on to the next slide. So just to talk you through those six narratives, they were one, that all life is dependent on the ocean from oxygen creation and protein provision to fresh water and weather, the ocean is the engine of our planet and all life is dependent on it and we must nurture it. Two, by harming the ocean, we harm ourselves. There's only one ocean and when we damage one part of it, we damage all of it and ourselves. 
By protecting the ocean, we protect ourselves. A healthy functioning ocean is the heart of our planet and it circulates oxygen, food and water and the weather and it helps us stay alive. Um, four is humans, the ocean, biodiversity and the climate are all intrinsically linked. So we have seen how connected we all are to nature and how, how reliant we are on it. So the ocean, wildlife, the climate and humans um, are all linked and we need to understand this and reflect this in our decisions. The ocean and climate action must be undertaken together and that reversing ocean change needs action now. There is no time. So these all sound like fairly kind of basic messages that you may have under, you know, you may have heard before. But what was interesting about this report is it was a report that stemmed from science. So by we met um, in a workshop for um, a couple of days, we had a lot of backing papers to inform this. And it was for the scientists to come out what they felt were the most communicable messages based on the scientific evidence that we have. Um, and the idea now is these are now being shared widely and um, we will be providing toolkits, et cetera, to start to include this in um, outcomings, you know, opportunities next year. So next slide, please. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen and learn about these three projects. You know, they all look at taking strategic communications and putting it at the heart of ocean campaigning. Um, all of the assets mentioned in the presentation can be shared via um, the Ocean Project. Um, and we look forward to working closely with the Ocean Projects and any of yourself throughout 2021. Thank you, Sophie. That was wonderful. And what I'm going to do here, just in the interest of time, as I do know a lot of people have to jump at the half hour, is actually skip ahead and we'll come back to the Q&A. And I want to just give the quick heads up on a couple of things in the future. One is, again, as mentioned at the beginning of our webinar, we're seeing a lot of emerging interest in especially the 30 by 30 campaign. Also one that's a little bit further down uh, on ensuring science-based fisheries policy, both based on successful pilot efforts that we've done with many of you. Uh, so you would not be coming in cold. Uh, there are actually some really good examples incorporating a lot of the great advice you've heard from Sophie on this webinar. Uh, the next thing is that our usual first Friday webinars will be held on the second Friday of the new year because it's Jan uh, the first Friday is January 1. And on that, we're going to have uh, two special guests, Sarah Guy of ODI and Justin Kenny of the UN Foundation. They're going to be going through some of those moments. If you remember that graphic Sophie showed of when we have to put sales up as a community, uh, these are the times during the calendar. They're going to kind of walk us through the calendar of 2021. And flag some of those times that are upcoming uh, when it really is going to be important that we all kind of sail together and share some common stories, messages around key points and keeping with good guidance from groups like uh, Sophie and her team. Uh, so with that, let me now scroll back. And uh, for those who have a little more time and can stick with us uh, and, and get a couple of questions um, uh, back uh, for Sophie, and um, I don't know if we really need the Q&A screen, but after my technical snafu with the lack of audio on that video, I'm not gonna challenge myself here. Uh, mm -hmm. Sophie, the first thing I wanna do is just thank you again. And I'll start with a moderator question. There's been a lot of conversation in the zoo and aquarium community about increasingly being part of the global ocean conservation movement. And I'd love you to speak a little bit more to the role uh, where you see aquariums, zoos, and museums adding the most value to that movement and complement to what others are doing who are part of the flotilla? Hi, yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, I think, you know, I spend a lot of time working um, with different uh, NGOs from, you know, small to large. I attend most of the big international meetings around oceans um, and work very closely with scientists. Um, and again and again and again, the thing that really, the really strong message that comes out is that we need a shared narrative and we need that narrative to get to the masses. Um, many of these organizations, you know, some of them have large memberships, but many of them don't. Um, and we just need to ensure that we are 
getting the opportunity to take some of these very simple concepts about what we need to do around the ocean and sharing them with as many members of the general public as possible. I think for people with an ocean interest, we sort of presume that people really understand the role of our ocean in sort of, our, you know, us being alive. Um, but they don't, you know, people, when people think about the oceans, they really think about going on holiday and swimming in the sea and blah, blah, blah. But the role it plays at an earth system level, the oxygen it provides, the role as a, for climate mitigation, we need people to understand it as a key, um, as a key issue, and it kind of needs to be everywhere. So. And a good follow up question here, Sophie, which is, uh, what's the best way that you found, you know, given the reach that I'm always amazed at the reach that aquariums, zoos, and museums have, as you alluded to earlier. Uh, often, one of the challenges is documenting public opinion. Are, have you seen things that are particularly effective in terms of moving decision makers? Uh, when we, you know, what are some of the best ways to show uh, that the public you've reached really is concerned and does care after you've engaged with them? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think it needs to be um, a lot of noise. So you know, it's like it, you need to be hearing it from various different um, avenues. I think. I mean, petitions can be effective, but again, there are a lot of petitions out there. Um, I think a lot of it is about like getting these stories into the media, like doing blogs, sharing them with partners, running small projects, keeping it very basic, very simple, um, just to really get some of those messages across uh, is really key. So you might think, well, I've just done a blog, um, but every single piece out there counts. So um, it's about having that collective noise and that collective amplification. Um, you know, it's amazing. You never know the thing that's going to really influence that decision maker. There are a lot of um, NGOs who have, you know, very, very strategic and well thought out advocacy strategies to reach that one person at the top. But what they really need is they need that big shouting behind it. Um, there's all, one of my favorite phrases is smokes and mirrors. Um, there's an awful lot of things via communication that can also do smoke and mirrors. So, you know, what we mean by that is you can just demonstrate. So within your community, even if you might be doing, you know, five different people are doing something small in their towns. If you package that up um, and get that into the right medium, whether it's on your website or in your blog or in a local newspaper, it can really, really have an impact. Um, so yeah, never think that anything that anybody does is too small because we basically need everybody to be doing whatever they can. And, and, and that's great, Sophie, and that's a great thing to end on. And one of the things that I will add just in the, uh, for those in this audience is I've also been really impressed at the way people have been able to take, when, when we say a common message, you can make that your own and develop your own innovative way to engage your audiences based on what you know works best for them. But the key is having that commonality and enough consistency so yeah. that we can, I guess, as the overused phrase goes, be the rising tide that lifts the boat. Um, well, with that, uh, thank you so much, Sophie. It's really been a pleasure to have you with us uh, today. And again, this uh, for those who may have enjoyed this webinar and want to share it with friends, there will be, in keeping with Sophie's good advice, a blog post about this webinar, along with a link to the recording as soon as it becomes available. So uh, thanks again, and hopefully we'll see most of you and many more in the new year. All best. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thanks, Sophie. Bye-bye.